was clay gathered at the Kennebec and processed and refined. And, oh, yeah. These are good. They're and, white. Um, they're, they're I'm hot. thinking it was because we got the temperature up too high too quickly. I don't think so. You think it was the clay? Yes. And, or the other thing is preheating, which means at the low end of the temperature, but if it fails because of the poor water, you get spalls. Yeah, I think mine did too. I want you, you get a certain kind of breakage, and you can just look at that and go, oh, that's the, breakage? That's the steam. That That's, you know spalling from moisture escape. Okay, then it was the clay. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. And, and well, there, what was the break this like? It was just shattered. It was just and crumbly almost, yeah. right? See, too silty. So it might have been more silt than clay. Okay. But that's what happens. And just find a, you know, it's good to talk to local potters. That's what I, I found anywhere you go. Yeah. If you find somebody who's dug in and has a home pottery or small business, even if they don't use the local earthenware, at one point in their life, they will have got curious about it, and they'll know where there's good clay. Good. I've almost never met a really good, you know, and you know how, like, when you're good at what you do, like, I don't know, well, probably you, but, you know, I'm the, trying to The think. metal are just over there. Yeah, um, myself, various people. See, they love to be approached and exchange information that's important and stuff, right. and their sense of curiosity. So usually really good crafts people are good people to talk about the craft with. So potters, they'll know where there's native clay. Right. And they'll go, I've used it, it fires this color. They might say, oh yeah, I did that years ago, you know, I got a couple few pieces on the counter, you know, on the shelf over there, and they'll, you know, whatever. Mm. But the other thing is... Um, that one just fired like a piece of cantaloupe. Skin. Yeah, I know, it's flexible. <laughs> Make little tiles, like <laughs> almost exactly like what I made there. Okay. And fire them like in a briquette. Okay. You know, like just when you do your, um, but you got to do the careful preheating, and then get them into coals and cover them over they with coals and test them with tiles before you make. Now, stuff. when you say the careful preheating, do you, do you understand what it means by that? Yeah. That's what I did Put in the pan, the and it took yeah. me two hours, you know, to make sure they were above the boiling point of water. Right, that's yeah. the part Without that exploding. I haven't heard. Is that's that the hardest, that's where everybody fails. Unless above the boiling point of water, yeah. where it's really, really hot to the touch, where you're going to burn yourself. Absolutely. And I didn't know that, because yeah. I've, I've, I've done the, you know, the pre-firing, but it hasn't been so hot that I'm, it's hard to touch it. Yeah. And it's like it's, it's been warm. It's been warm enough where I can hold it and I can put it in the fire. It's like dualism versus, you know, monism or something. Right. You know, philosophically, you can you can look at it either way. You can look at it as one firing, and you bring the temperature up really really carefully, or you can look at it as two stages where. It's like a bipeaked thing where you really carefully get it up over the boiling point of water to smoke off the, the moisture, and then you can let it rip. Nice. You know, then you can just, it doesn't matter how quick you raise the temperature once you've done that delicate preheating. In a kiln, it's one stage because you're just raising the temperature and you raise it so slowly at the beginning, that water smoking stage. But in primitive, in primitive firing, they pre they preheat it. It's two stages. Yeah, or, or that's a way of looking at it. Right. Because even the person who's doing the primitive firing might still just say, "Oh no, I just bring it up to temperature slowly and then let it rip," and and it just is a curve. You know, it's just one stage. It's okay. just I fire it. You know. And you could actually get into the different woods to produce the higher temperatures, right? You would start off. And everybody's soft. wrong. Well, no, I shouldn't say everybody's wrong about that, but most people have a misconception. Okay. Not big chunks of hickory. Not what burns hot in your wood stove. I use small pieces of pine. <laughs> Sumac. Driftwood is great. So you that'll know, get just, the temperature high. Yes. A lot of air space for the oxygen and burns fast. The fire is 20 minutes. You oh, know, from, really? from, from, <laughs> from when, he just watched it from when you preheated the yeah. piece to when it's glowing. And when it's glowing, it's done. Right. From when you preheated the piece to when it's glowing. 20 minutes. Half wow. an hour. 45 minutes is a slow one. You know, and after that, it might be seem like the firing takes hours because you're letting it cool down. Right. Or, like I say, you can take them on hot with tongs. It doesn't matter at that point. But the firing's done. As soon as the clay body is glowing and incandescing, that's the ceramic change. You're watching it happen. And then you leave it as it slowly cools so it doesn't crack. Is that more? No, that's why I stuck it in the water. Once it's okay. once it's once it's glowed. And if you get it to break after it glowed, it's because there was a crack in it. It's because there were coils that weren't fused well. It's because of something you did. Because if it's a proper firing and you got it glowing, you have ovenware now. It's got. It's, it should be able to withstand amazing. 
temperature. You know, I put my pots right in the fire and cook them. Nice. You know, that's what the, that's the point. That's why they're primitive people made pots that way. You can cook on it. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, cool. Which is not really a design. It's more a texture. Thin the well, they think material. I think it compresses the clay so it's less porous, and it might help fuse the. Um, coils a little better because it's a coil pot but it also might be just an attractive texture it's hard to say how practical the paddling is yeah but it was paddled and they always did it and they paddled the whole thing the lip and on the inside and that's really how you can tell the first ceramic period pottery because they also take um, in many places take a stick and wrap it with cordage and then use that for the paddle. But in New England, that is not the earliest stuff. And this is kind of miniature, although you'd find vessels this size. But they might be typically, like I say, up to nice big cook pots. Yeah. And it has the, the cone shape so it can yep. fit in the fire and you it can rest rocks. It could be slightly rocks, rounded or... or it could be cone. And this first stuff, it can be conoidal with no lip. So it's just like this, or it can have a little bit of a subtle lip. And occasionally here and there in the first ceramic period, you just find bowls, you know. Um, but this, there's much more, as they go on with the ceramic tradition, there's much more variety in vessel forms. Hmm.